and we are back playing a bit of the celeste soundtrack there absolute banger in my view <laughs> love to see it um so what were we saying sex robots sex robots i feel like there was a question yes there was a question there was a question yes sex robots in therapy Oh, yeah. And other use of sex robots uh, outside of entertainment, basically, but use them for actual, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, but yeah, use them for other purpose, yeah. such as therapy. And that is a really hot topic. And that is a really touchy topic as well, because we're talking about paraphilias and yeah, some stuff that can get a bit dark. Mm -hmm. so maybe we don't go there <laughs> uh, but just, looping that back around to like the whole oh no people will prefer robots to people like I mean people already do for various things so, yeah but I don't think it will replace humans I think that there is a there is a general belief that is linked to a moral panic that robots are going to replace human whatever the sector Mm -hmm. whether it is um, for entertainment, whether it is, I mean, AI started creating art and everyone went crazy and they passed a law saying that it couldn't be considered belonging to someone, to an AI, um, if it's art created by an AI. And, and um, where are the boundaries if consent is not implicit? And and this is, this is a big question when we talk about sex robots. So just to get back to that right now, um, that that is... The question of morality and where we put it. Um, if we take a sex robot, by essence, it is meant to to be used with or without consent. Well, I mean, there is no consent in, in the design. Is there a world in which we implement consent in sex robots? Um, but just even if they say yes every time, it's just to train people. It's the same way as asking uh, uh, saying please and thank you to conversational agents, right? Uh, it's just about implementing a habit there and, and keeping it real that way, mm -hmm. saying, oh, oh, the boundaries don't disappear. But at the same time, do, do, do people that have certain pulsion that uh, I would consider that they suffer from it, um, could it be a good way to outlet this pulsion and therefore not hurt society? Uh, you know, th this is also a question to ask, and I don't have an answer for it, and, and I don't pretend to. It is really just a question. Um, but yes, implementing, also using sex robots to teach consent. That might be a really interesting thing to do for people with mental disabilities, um, because we know that it is a really vulnerable population when it comes to sexuality. Uh, there is, I'm thinking uh, of a, a few uh, amazing persons um, that I worked with and uh, that have uh, have a mental disability. Um, well, the thrill of going against consent may be used. Yes, exactly. But let's let's go back to mental disability. Uh, I know that this was a big conversation uh, with people from, that have trisomia. Uh, so, is that the same term in English? I trisomia. Am, I'm not sure. Um, it's when you have uh, multiple, you have too many chromosomes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's referred to like as Down syndrome. Down syndrome, Down in, syndrome. In like English. Uh, yeah, it is Down syndrome. And so um, people with Down syndrome, which might have as one of the aspects uh, of, the, uh, of the disability and erotomania, um, and so their erotomania is that you think everyone wants to have sex with you, but it's also that you you want to have sex a lot. And then you have people um, with mental disability, whether it is Down syndrome or not, that don't have that, but maybe are not in the capacity to give enlightened consent. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I mean... It, I mean, this like, is such complicated conversations to have. Bear, bear you know? in mind that, like, we're, we're again UK centric on my view, but like, we're we're at a point where <laughs> legally we say people cannot give consent when they're drunk or intoxicated, yes. but like people go yeah. out to get drunk to have sex with people. So yeah, like by the letter of the law, 
neither party can provide consent therefore it's yeah it's you know they have not consented and that's an issue yeah so like you know like that's a, a big deal and, and let alone and, and i think part of it is that you know like I, again i'm not an expert on this subject but people find it awkward i mean there's a whole thing in this disabled community about people accepting the same people have sex but people find it uncomfortable yeah. or they feel a bit awkward so they don't want to talk about it don't want to think about it even though like you need the correct kind of legislative and care related things in place yeah. to ensure that everyone is as, as safe as possible 100 percent. and so there is a big part of this lack of education that comes from as you said people being uncomfortable talking about it, it it's but ableism let's be honest, really you're gonna call a spade a spade it's ableism yeah go, well you disabled people and don't matter we don't want to think about it exactly except those people disabled as they are they have needs they have wants they have they have drives they they have abilities they're not just disabled they have abilities a lot of them um and i'm sorry i'm getting a bit strong about this but <laughs> this is a, a subject that um, is, is really close to my heart um, because I, I think it's really unfair the way we treat them. And I've met a couple uh, that both of them were disabled. They had both Down syndrome and they had been married for more than 20 years. And this gave me hope <laughs> in a way. Um, they were living together. They were... Char sorry, Charlie's just putting the chat thing on Android. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but... We also had a, a young lady uh, that had another type of impairment and um, she was having sexual relationships, uh, but everyone was a bit uncomfortable talking about it, but she was taking the contraceptive pill, but, and it was a full situation where people wouldn't talk about it, but she obviously needed to talk about it and everyone was just uncomfortable discussing it with her because they were like, yeah, but we're, it's like if we're talking to a child and yes but no yeah but like everyone um, needs to know how to do things safely like that's the this person thing. is over 18 years old she's legally in her own right to go have sexual relationships the problem is defining consent and i do believe that sexual robots can be used um in that in that sense again it's a belief i don't have data to support that i don't have experimentation to support that in any way well, I do think that we could find a world where we could design sexual robot to teach consent to I mean, population. I know, I know, I know. Charlie pointed out in the chat. And maybe this just is because we exist as the antithesis of each other, uh, even to the point where you know, here's me with my really bright white hair dressed in dark colors. You're over there in your nice bright colors with your light, and you know, so sort of really going for that antithesis kind of look. But I'm also like, my issue would be that people would just find a way to manipulate this kind of thing for their own awkwardly evil benefit like you know like mm. yo charlie mentioned the example was like yo where the, the trying to get around that consent with sex robots might be a gain and again i think we haven't we, i can't remember if i actually mentioned it again to you specifically but like um the, a british tv show called humans uh, is about oh, yeah, androids yeah. and they become sentient. I've watched that. it. Yeah, it's like really, really good, right? There's quite a few overlaps it between is. that and Detroit. But like right at the very yeah. beginning, there's that like creepy old dude who's like, oh, like be scared with like a sex mm -hmm. robot. And it's like, yeah. how, like where where does that fit? Like how, yeah. you know what I mean? Like that, that's a weird kind of boundary. And you'd have to consider all those type of possibilities when you're kind of building that type of structure. And I don't want to be a party pooper, but I'm going to say it now. The industry does not fucking care <laughs> at this point. <laughs> no, it doesn't. They're making a lot of money out of it and good for them because they're developing tech that we can test later. Um, but that's my problem. We can test later once it's being used broadly. Uh, but at the same time, again, same conversation. They're developing the tech. Uh, because they have the money so um, not talking about business ethics here at all uh, not the point but just yeah we need to consider all those questions and I'm just used to having people um, to reading a lot of work about sex robots that is based on opinions and based on internalized values and internalized beliefs and 
And that's cool. We're not we're not sitting here saying like it is fact. A couple of questions though is like, do you think it's better to have robots used for those type of actions? Um, because it's like it it gets back to that whole, well, if they're not really sentient, does it matter what you do to them or towards them? And then also like, uh, and and Charlie's putting it like the whole, you potentially get to this whole Blade Runner kind of thing where do the androids know they're androids? And when you think about like, um, Alice for example in Detroit, like. It's not really clear she knows she's an android, or she's at least told yeah. not to act like an android, and that's really quite mind blowing. Yeah, but the question of consciousness is really interesting uh, because we still don't understand it in humans' brain, so we wouldn't be able to recreate it at this point, at least not on purpose. Mm-hmm. Then Bob, Bob sort of following up with like the majority of sort of prostitution is because the person does not want to ask for consent to do an action so therefore it's kind of transactionalized now now again i don't want us to go down a, a more sort of yeah darker broader path but <laughs> there, there is argument in sort of uh, feminist literature that prostitution of itself cannot really be consented because it's transactionalized and people need money for sustainability and to live um you know so therefore um... are they actually able to provide consent when it's, it's deemed to be sort of coercion and I would say that this is a good point, uh, but there is also the other side of things, which is when you talk about prostitution that way, you're also removing the power to a lot of people who prostitute themselves on purpose um, and not out of need, but out of will, because there is. And uh, I think we need to also be conscious of those people that have chosen to work like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is important. Well, I, but again, like, it's on that. The point that there is a distinction to be made there. Yes. Is. No, it is. There, there is. There is. And that's uh, also why I'm a big advocate for legalizing prostitution and stop putting our heads in the sand. Um, the, the verb choice of used for those actions causes pause. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yes. It's, a, it's, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a very complicated area, right? That's the whole the whole point it's complicated and and when you consider yeah. like the whole point of detroit is that robots are also complicated like and there it's again we're going back to this it's gray right it's not black or white it's not good or bad and nothing is uh in my opinion everything has positive and negative uh even the worst things i'm sure you can find positive arguments for I'm not saying that they should be there, far from that, but there is some things that you can always find positive arguments. I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's a counter stance, but it's like, it doesn't matter so much whether something is this or that, it's more of the perception. Yes. Like, like you know, like, um, pe- you know, um, it's an idiom, I'm kind of, I don't you know, if I get banned off Twitch, but like, you know, there's that idiom of like, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. It's how you spin that as a perception that is more yes. important than the actual inherent and, action. And it's it's a really interesting uh, area of research as well. And to think about terrorism or extremism in general, uh, I mean, you can talk about cults if you go down that path. Mm-hmm. Um, what was his name? Uh, Charlie something something, one of the worst cult leader ever that never killed anyone. Oh, um, I, I, to be honest, I'm not that I'm not that fresh up on my cult leaders. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yes, when you bring in objects into the conversation, of course, Manson. Uh, because that the name? Manson, Manson, yes, amazing. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so yeah, Manson, Manson's way, for example, have been studied, and there is a reason for that. It is because we humans sometimes have failures in our critical thinking (laughs) and that's an understatement um (laughs) and we we end up we end up making decisions that in our referential seem to be the best decision and then we end up in a situation where we do have the belief that the norm we're in is the norm Mm -hmm. and it is how we grew as a society and this is how you have extremism in society as well Um, and I can see that happen in a lot of different contexts than religious belief, really. Mm-hmm. 
and but you will have again like i feel like i'm always being reductive of their own conversation it's not it's not what i'm intended to do but you couldn't essentially break it down to what is socially accepted within a certain collective group locale uh you know whatever and then them deeming xyz to not be because then these things get labeled as extreme or you know it, and it, it's like it's that sort of social psychology of in group out group you know yeah you look for the biggest difference between us and them whoever them are yes. and then therefore sort of target that monopolize it and sort of propagandize it that's not a word but turn it you know turn it into propaganda to uh, reinforce our own perspectives views to reinforce our own position usually from an sort of authoritarian and slash or kind of you know, a we're doing it to maintain that we keep our ide- ideological view of power upon ourselves. Yeah, and as soon as you start talking about something a bit bigger, like dealing with a group or a bigger group, you can also talk about the trade-off between the freedom and security. That takes a big role into agreeing or not with uh, with different policies and different regulations, different norms. Mm-hmm. Um, and in COVID, we have seen that kind of effect apply a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, he also prayed on the week and those desperate for some kind of norm, no matter how the norm was framed, they all drank the Kool-Aid. Yes, exactly. And and this is, if you look into extremism and turning uh, into extremism or cults, uh, that's usually what happens. That That is usually the population that will end up joining. Uh, you, you have vulnerable populations. Mom mentality as well. Of course, having the feeling to belong is one of the most craved for feeling in a human being. Yeah. Um, and even people who say, oh, no, I'm an island. I don't need anyone. Again, like, I know I don't want to sound too wishy-washy here, but like, I think people are very quick to forget that, like, we need other people to function. Like, as a society, yes. I think, you know, I think I've said it before, but like, the the chain of people involved in like getting you your milk in the morning is huge. Yes. The number of people, and if everyone just went, well, no, screw you, because I only care about myself. You get to that very sort of um, Ayn Rand kind of Ayn, Ayn Rand rather kind of perspective, don't you? You know, of like that whole like, well, I only care about myself, and I'm the only person that matters to me. Kind yeah. Of, and that's a very, in my view, a dangerous perspective to kind of take. <laughs> It is, it is, and uh, it's a realistic. Um, we've had that conversation with friend not so long ago, um, because she was mentioning some of her friends. I absolutely love that we have been talking about there too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, the, she was mentioning some of her friends that ghost themselves into being out of the greed of society. But the moment they're sick in France, healthcare is free. You go to the hospital, you're being taken care of. Mm-hmm. The moment uh, they need something, they go to the supermarket, not straight away, but if they don't find it uh, in more local agriculture or things, they will go to a supermarket. So as much as they want to say that they're off the grid, they're not. They have smartphones, they have internet that, you know, so today saying you're off the grid, I'm guessing it's possible. I'm sure it's possible, but people need to realize that it's way harder than they think. Again, like I don't want to get... Ah, cool. I'm happy if you like it. <laughs> I don't want to get too dystopian, but like, I mean, physically try to imagine living off the grid, right? I mean, like, that would be so difficult. So difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not only from like a, a social <laughs> cap, but also point of view, like maybe even internally, because like you wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. Yes, you know, taking online that's true. through the space and the time. You know, we're literally traveling through space and time as we have this conversation, both in terms of where we are oh, geographically, yeah. but we're in two different time zones. Yes, we and are. All the people watching this are also in a different space and time. Like that's, you know. Um, yes. But I just think Crazy. like it, it would just be nigh on impossible. Man, impossible like do you think so i think it is possible i mean have you met the Ham- the amish you know there, there is there is people who do it but it is not a norm yeah and, and you know and prejudice that comes with that of yeah. course of course well you would need to be in a community like such i guess to be happy so you could still have like your own community 
yeah, yeah. therefore your social Sorry. needs yeah right. i kind of was looking at it it's like a, you just go off completely on your own i think that would be like really yeah challenging. i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to do it i mean also because you know video games and stuff uh, <laughs> but <laughs> people i like people tendency to like people uh, people are um <laughs> people are right yeah right. And we were we we're actually having this the same thinking uh, about how internet is making everything way easier yesterday uh, with Charlie. So there you go. We ended <laughs> up having a call with people from different time zones, different places. <laughs> he I was alone. Know. So many bad stories start with that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got to yeah, watch the quiet people... ones. <laughs> because social norms, y'all. Social norms, they're not just bad. They're also really good. They keep people in line in check because we're animals and people like to say that we're better than animals guess what we are animals we're, we're animals in uh, suits and ties exactly and sometimes we're just stupid and if we don't have something to stop us such as a social norm and a consequence to i mean our actions, you know most people should have a conscience but maybe that's a stretch <laughs> but a, okay 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 um i'm gonna bounce on that a conscience mm -hmm. Do you mean good and bad? I mean a moral compass. Okay. Who puts the moral compass down? Uh, I I mean, I think like it's something that you can internalize, but it's, it's something you learn. I don't think it's inherent. It's something you have to learn. But like, there you if, go. But if you, but so if it you, is culture. Well, <laughs> it's related to culture, but like if you, even on like a basis of like something to yourself, like, you know, slapping a piece of, of wood and then being like, you know, oh, that hurt my hand, so I wouldn't do that again. Like, the whole, the whole um, you know, kids touching the fire kind of ideology, you know what I mean? Like, don't do that because it'll burn you. But why? I need to understand. You know, like that kind of mm -hmm. thing. But so then I... when you talk about morality, you usually talk about, what, about others, right? Mm. It's more about behaviors towards others and the consequences of such, whether they are big consequences like, criminality consequences whether they are emotional consequences well i was gonna so, so maybe i'm challenging myself i'm not quite sure but it's like is it state or trait like do so is like is our per does our personality impact that and is that something that is fixed or is it learned you know i don't i'm not going to go down the whole biological positivism perspective but like some people would argue that well you have fixed there is -ish characteristics and therefore the rest of it is then learned Nature, nature. There, there, there is an interesting part of that, especially when you start talking about empathy, because a lot of that comes with empathy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a full, a full belief that empathy is uh, half biological, half learned, which gives hope because you can learn it, uh, you can train it, but you also have innate empathy. Is it a binary scale? I'm guessing we're talking about good and bad. Even well. well even empathy like is it is empathy binary like is, is morality? what is empathy but yeah like well funny you should ask because i did quite <laughs> a lot of reading about empathy when doing i have a definition as well let's see know, if we agree on the, the registration the document one. for my phd and like quintessentially it's a philosophical issue uh no one agrees on it <laughs> no. no one agrees what empathy <laughs> is uh however no. i think like Yo, empathy is empathy. <laughs> empathy is get your quotes out. Um, empathy is the the ability to want to understand the perspective of someone else, and actually applying that thought process, not just as or after an action is performed, but also before. So that ability to okay. be able to uh, take perspective and anticipate potential outcomes. But also, I think, like, you know, not to be, like, completely circular, but, like, whether or not you have empathy towards yourself. <laughs> like, you, like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, like, mm -hmm. don't, like, you know, to beat oneself up about something and, like, be show empathy towards yourself as well. Like, you know, okay, actually, yeah, it's fine that I didn't do do this paper this weekend. It's, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, is that too close? To <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> So like I, mean, I don't know okay. if that's what I've written, but like it's just like you know to to hear other people, to want to listen to them and understand how things might affect them. Well, what I hear is a lot of theory of mind, really. 
at the end of the day, we always go circle back to the theory of mind. <laughs> Too close. <laughs> close. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you have you have theory of mind, of course, that is to this point, I think, something that a lot of people still agree on because it is broad enough, um, but also precise enough in a way, which is fun. And um, there is a part uh, of the definition. I I use the definition from neuroscience from Desity. Um, I would recommend reading his work, amazing. Um, he was saying that there is three levels of empathy and a lot of researchers were kind of agreeing to it or with it. And you will have cognitive empathy, which is basic perspective taking. Then you have uh, emotional empathy, which is a step further. And then you have uh, motivational empathy. See, look, you're, um, you're, the, you're the academic here. Because like that's, I knew I'd like read that, but I couldn't articulate that like properly. <laughs> I was just giving you like how I personally like use it. But I think like the written definition is, is those type of breakdowns. Because what I think uh, motivational like is fairly like newer. People previously yes, like, yes, you, yes, you yes. just have cognitive and emotional. Like just two. It's like, so it was your ability to correct me if i'm wrong but like mm -hmm. understand the chain of events that might impact another person it's so like that very cognitive like logical yeah. kind of thing and then the emotional one is understanding how an event might make someone feel and attempting to take their perspective to understand their feelings yeah. and that's like the the way it was kind of scientifically academically but you could you could cognitively know how they will feel but emotional but not, empathy is also about feel it. feeling it yeah. exactly like i can exactly. say if i call you you're both academics i'm plenty loads yeah. uh, like <laughs> I, I could physically process and Thank say you. if i say something mean to you that might make yeah. you feel sad or angry and sort of draw the draw yeah. the flow chart out if you will the detroit flow chart <laughs> for my dialogue yeah. options but then actually interpreting what that feeling means and attempting to feel it is a separate thing exactly because also you could make decisions out of cognitive empathy well uh, just is, because is that not make people that are of... and i don't necessarily agree with the term but like the way you oh a sociopath they don't feel emotions they just replicate them even if you don't go as far as sociopath um you can simply talk about autism um and not all autistic person as sociopath that's not at all what i'm saying uh, i'm saying that there is a in in on the autistic spectrum there is a moment where feeling what the other person feels is challenging extremely challenging because it's about understanding first and understanding might be challenging as well. So in a way you would need to have the ability to have cognitive empathy to then go to emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. But then if you go down that road, what about the mirror neurons that you have right there that are able to reproduce what you're seeing? So basically you see someone suffering, crying, and you will feel it. You will not just understand what's happening. You're like, oh, so well there's there, that there whole, is the full conversation there's that whole kind of like and as charlie points out like just other neuro yeah because people can be overly i forget the exact terminology but like overly empathetic like feel empathy too strongly yes um, yes 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 but like the thing with that is you, you get like this chicken and egg scenario of like what comes first because based on the the mirror one you can see someone crying but you might not know why that is because you can be crying yeah laughing, exactly you can be crying from sadness. You can be crying from joy. You yeah. know, uh, yeah. crying just from feeling such emotion. You know, I mean, like, uh, I, I, you know, I'm one of those people that if I get like actually really angry, there's a point where I end up just getting really cry, like crying, because my body yeah. almost like just Me doesn't too. know how to process the emotion. So you just, you yeah, know, you don't start I'm crying. frustrated. I get frustrated. Yeah, I'm just like, um, yeah. So like, the so the the translation of like, oh, yo, x plus y equals z doesn't mm -hmm. translate and that's where that's where the debate comes in of well is a trait or is a state well you could say it's trait because there's a lot of facial expression sort of work yeah. done like basic emotions that like we are us and animals for example have the ability to process what those are yeah this is a happy face this is a sad face this is an angry face well, there is there is six um six basic emotions uh face face 
facial uh, expression. That's our facial expression. Thank you. <laughs> I don't speak English anymore at this point. <laughs> it's just going to be mumble. Uh, that's our um, recognizable in all cultures around the world. Uh -huh. Only six. And those are joy, anger, surprise, disgust, and two Fear. others. Fear and sadness. Sadness, yeah. Um, yeah. So like you have those, but then it's like the skill part of empathy is trying to interpret what those mean. And then, and this is the part I missed out actually, responding to it correctly. So there's not only like, oh. The responding to it correctly is the hardest part. Yeah. Like, honestly, and there is no rule that works every time. And, and again, so see previous also... example, you see someone crying in the street. You, 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 you have to then try and interpret what that is to then respond yeah. to it correctly. Because if someone's crying from laughter, going over and patting them on the shoulder and saying, it's all right, is, is out of context and wouldn't work. Yeah. You know? And also, if you don't know the person, is it too personal? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it... There is a lot to take into account. And honestly, those can come as a natural learning for some people mm -hmm. and lucky them. And then you have neurodivergence that... And that's when cultural bias is coming as well. Exactly, 100%. So uh, while we're on this track, we're down this track, and obviously because I'm looking at it as a research area, but this then <laughs> becomes into, okay, so if we're talking about the potential to learn empathy and learn empathetic skills, okay? Yes. Do What is your stance on, do you need to experience the specificity of what another person has experienced to gain empathy for it? It depends. <laughs> I'll give you a more specific example, okay? No, no, I, I, can, I can answer, and then you see if you need some more specificity. Okay. For some situations, no. I think, and for some people, no. Again, we're all really very in our ways. Um, for some other people, it might be harder, and therefore learning, even through virtual environment, therefore not experience it yourself, but just experiencing it through virtual environment, might be enough, more than enough even, to feel empathy because it's about understanding. I think understanding a situation can teach us to be empathetic towards it. I think that some people don't need to understand and are just more empathetic by essence. And whether it is cognitively empathetic or emotionally empathetic to me are two different things. Um, and therefore, I think you can have all situations and I think you can learn, of course. I think there are some people that might not be able to learn. I think there are some people that want to learn and will be able to and good for them and some people just don't need to learn because they got it okay i'm annoyed because that's a very good answer <laughs> <laughs> i used empathy in my master thesis still got it Fair. still, still got, got it, got you, it. You, you're teaching me business can let me reference that master's thesis <laughs> Like, you got it right oh, i need to uh, send it to you charlie as well there, there are some <laughs> situations that we can know and feel empathy through but uh backstory we can all carry with us informs that the reason i asked that yeah. is because like a lot of sort of the, the work that um, the work i do um i do a lot of like equality diversity come on you work. do work stop diminishing no, yourself no, no, but like like it's not like it's not like work as in i'm not paid to do it kind of thing um but a lot of, like the edi kind of stuff that i i engage with um particularly from the you know the disability community is like i shouldn't have to like put a blindfold on you and make you say spend the day being blind like me for you to get it like it shouldn't take that level for you to be able to understand that actually like someone who is in my case say blind has additional needs right like that's the mm -hmm. kind of point because you very quickly kind of fall into this like an eye for an eye the whole world goes blind kind of philosophy of well, you need to experience exactly what I've experienced to understand me. And I yeah, really and disagree yeah. with that. I think, like, yeah, if you listen to people, like, because all people really want is to feel heard, right? And to know that someone is listening to them and taking the time to listen to them and processing what they're saying and then maybe, you know, acting to or responding to it, right? That's a big belief of mine. And it's like, 
if we just took more time to listen to people, particularly people from marginalized groups and people that need additional things from society that is not being met, for them to have a good and happy and sort of safe existence in the world, like maybe it's because I I am an empathetic person. I think a, you know it could be said for a lot of people that go into psychology. I think psychology in of itself is quite empathetic. You're trying to understand other people, yeah. Um, but like, you know, just listening to people and trying to garner what that is about is a is a way of paving that empathy, right? And I think. You know, the the whole point I'm sort of getting to with this to TLDR is like, if we all just listen to each other and listen to not one person, or maybe even a couple of people, but like groups of people, you know, like I'm on a disabled students panel and because we're all people with different needs, we disagree on stuff, but collectively we want to create change that is beneficial for everyone. And it's like, it's not quite as simple as like, okay, yeah, you need to experience exactly this to understand it. And then obviously my leading kind of bias point was, because I think as we've just spent, you know, five hours chatting about Detroit and issues spilling off that, like can video games teach us anything and provide us with perhaps empathy? Well, yeah, because that's given us experiences, thoughts and decisions. I don't need to live through the events of Detroit to feel empathetic to those people's causes, right? Yes, yeah and and thankfully thankfully Thankfully. but i would just add so first what charlie said uh, a point of connection to even a very small aspect can be very powerful uh but above all listening and not assuming Mm -hmm. yes 100 percent. when we talk about a point of connection i want to get back to that it might be hard um again i'm going to take an example of something that happened just last week um one of my close friends came to visit well some of them actually and we started discussing in another environment than usual uh so here in germany there is quite a lot of racism and especially in bavaria i would say even more than elsewhere personal opinion here um (laughs) towards the turkish population uh, and the turkish descent and communities and uh, i come from a greek family Therefore, I have some beef by culture with the Turkish that dates back to the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. I do not discriminate the Turkish, though, because I do not believe that a government is a person. And unless a Turkish person comes to me and say, "Uh, you're Greek, (laughs) then I won't be mad. Um, But I can understand cultural bias. Mm -hmm. I do have cultural bias, and that is 100% true. I'm fully aware of it, so I work around it. And this friend was telling me about... Sorry, just to interject, though. But I think you just said something really wonderful there, like a really great soundbite of, like, I'm aware of it, so I work around it. Whereas I think, like, even having that awareness to then operate around it... Because even sometimes people are aware, but they're, like, they're not willing to put the effort in to work around it they're just ah well i am x so screw it yeah but uh, i studied psychology for a long time and i like people (laughs) so i try to i try to work around my innate bias um i think everyone should get that those tools as well to work around those though i think it comes a lot from ignorance as well Mm -hmm. anyway and and so she was telling me about her ex-boyfriend that uh well i don't remember exactly it was not a greek thing it was another thing but oh no he was from uh he was kurd i think so from um, a people that has been uh, eliminated if not genocide by the turkish or the ottoman empire at some point mm-hmm. uh and not so long ago in history uh i think it was during second world war actually and then close around those days And her best friend is from Turkish descent uh, directly, uh, first generation. So her parents are first first generation uh, immigrants. And so the boyfriend and the best friend, the best friend was willing to meet the boyfriend, but the boyfriend was unwilling for the years they've been together to meet the best friend or if to meet her, to be nice with her. And so the friend that was here couldn't understand that. And so we had a full conversation uh, and that friend in question is really smart and really open-minded. So it's it's not about being close-minded to, to this. But she had a really hard time understanding that I get it. It's 
when you are born in a population, in a culture that tells you this is no, and you're at the time they were 20 years old, um, and, and you come into the world and now you have to face this, the only weapons you have to face all that is what you've been taught. And what you've been taught at this point is that this population is no. And that's all you get. And it's horrible. And I'm the first one to say, this is not okay. And we need to work around that. But mm -hmm. it comes with education. And talking, going back to empathy, it was hard for my friend to understand this thought process. And I'm not saying at no point is that okay. At no point uh, do I say this is a situation that is fair. It is unfair as hell. No, no, I think like, you know, because I don't know if it, if it contradicts what I was previously saying, but like, I'm a big believer in that like hate is, is learned. It's something that like people sort of say, like, oh, we do not like these people for reasons. And then if yeah. you say from a culturally point of view, like it, then that becomes ingrained. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and a re reinforcing bias, um, you know, and, and it it's and these are sort of thrust upon you from a very young age. Uh, and then you know it's that kind of like number twenty three kind of syndrome, isn't it? Of you, well, you're looking for it, so you repeatedly see it, which reinforms your biases, yeah. which reinforms that attitude. And it takes quite a long while in in both years and I think mental. I'm gonna say gymnastics to be able to really actually okay take a step back from that and attempt to take a more objective look at the facts. Now there are some really difficult things, like say for example politics. You know. It's very difficult to take a step back and look at the objective facts because they are so coloured and so impacted by uh, biases and opinions. Yeah. But then, you know, because I would sit here and say, as someone who has left-leaning political views, well, the current Conservative government have done a terrible job at everything. Look at all the statistics. Look at where all the money has gone. <laughs> you know, and I can say, well, I'm, but people would just say, but Chris, you're just reinforcing your own biases you're hitting me with data yeah. i have contrary data you know yeah. and and there are perhaps more recent parallels that are perhaps a bit more uh, spiky to go into but you know this whole well reliability of information and, yeah. and stuff um but yeah like you know children for example as, as charles put out like we'll play each other without biases until someone teaches them the biases yeah. but like by, exactly. by and large there is a thing that is taught yeah and this is proof of it. You know, it's one of multiple examples. There, There is internal biases that might be evolutionary. Um, for example, with people from different uh, colors, uh, different, I don't like the term race. I know in English you use it, but in French it is really a bad word, so we don't use it. Okay. Um, but yeah, from different ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um well, let me, well let me, like you, you say that but like there is like a legitimate like sort of i'm gonna say i'm not, I'm not philosophical evolutionary like, just on i think like ontological like what is race yeah what does that mean yeah and then yeah. people quickly go well ethnicity and and or religion and or anything else that we exactly sort of want it to be so it's a very because language is crap for, for french from a french perspective race uh refers to skin mm-hmm but we talk about race when we talk about races of dogs as well. Okay. Uh, and so, so we use in the English same we term. Say breed. Exactly. That's so nice. you wouldn't talk about a breed of humans. That would be diminishing a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. And race is a term that was used during the Second World War to refer to the Jews as well. Okay. So uh, we don't. Yeah. You wouldn't say race in the same context as in English for sure. Interesting. Uh, See, we're all learning. <laughs> exactly so ethnicity is a good term i like that mm -hmm. um and so yeah so we're talking about about evolutionary bias uh towards different ethnicity uh because as a white person biologically speaking i am used to seeing white person um and if i see something or someone different than me um, then I will have a first tick to say, oh, it's different. Mm -hmm. And I can, I do believe that we can overrun those bias by society and evolution and uh, mixing societies. And I mean, I grew up in a place with a lot of people from a lot of different ethnic, ethnic background. So I got that, that chance mm -hmm. uh, to be less biased today as a grown up. 
And I think, um, like, that, again, we put the broader cultural spectrum of, like, the role of the media and representation. Yeah. and Oh, my gosh, ourselves. yes. And, like, you know, again, oh. like, equally, like, Liverpool is a very culturally diverse place. People from different religions yeah. and ethnicities and stuff. And, like, I would say, um, even, like, from sort of social backgrounds and representations that Liverpool is a generally very inclusive place. You know, I've always been brought yeah. up that that is the vibe. Like, you know... In Liverpool, we sort of say, like, it doesn't matter who or what or where you are or where you're from or whatever, because yeah. you're Scouse first. Yeah. But, like, not, not the other characteristics don't matter. And if you're not, like, we from don't. Liverpool, you're adopted Scouse if you come here and you have a good time and you are respectful of the place kind of thing. Yeah. No, we don't, we don't have, uh, from where I come from, we don't have this unity thing. Also, friends, is really... Um, um, yeah, I think everyone will agree with me. Uh, <laughs> France is, is really racist. <laughs> I mean, you it's know, it's just a racist place. I mean, to be honest, racism in, isn't uh, institutional in the UK. There was a report that said so. <laughs> oh my gosh, my cat was racist for a good few <laughs> years. I the only visitor to my house were Chinese, all of whom she accepted. But as soon as a white person walked in, she would attack them. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's about habits. <laughs> I don't I don't even know. I don't even know how to respond to that. That's... <laughs> I just love this story. But it makes sense though. If you think about it, it does make sense. Yeah. It's... Um it goes back to us being animals. Mm-hmm. It honestly goes back just to that. And that's why I think everyone should realize that we are animals. And therefore, we have same reflexes as animals. The difference that we have society that allow us to override it. And I, and I think the point that we kind of like just sort of did loosely touch on is that if you deconstruct those by making yeah. diversity normalized, yes. it's way easier to remove those barriers. And then people aren't basically scared yeah. of any difference. And therefore, yeah. we can all live a slightly happier and less crummy society. Oh, my gosh, please. And then we can go back to having that diverse content in games and how, how this is such important an important topic. Because if you have diversity normalized in game and not there as diversity either, so not forced diversity, I think we mentioned that earlier, mm-hmm. um, I mean, this would be just amazing. You end up having people just yeah it's normal to have people in wheelchairs to have people that are that are albinos or to have people that i don't know maybe have a neurodiversity and therefore behavior that is a bit different it's a big thing i mean linking it to games like the disabled characters are not good they're just not good they're not good (laughs) representing they're either tokenistic they're either the bad guy because that's a trope Um, oh yeah and the phd you're you're having like two of the biggest thing in pop culture for the bad guy. Mm-hmm. You have a disability and you have a PhD. You're gonna turn I'm, into I'm a, a super villain. I'm sorry yeah. to tell you. I'm a super yeah. villain. Like, <laughs> pe- pe- people with albinism specifically are also usually cast as the villains. So I'm that triple code. triple thread. Yeah. So I'm I'm hitting the hat trick on that one. Clearly an evil genius. Oh my quote God. unquote. Um, I knew it. But like, <laughs> I, on, honestly, I like, called it. <laughs> It's either it's either tokenistic, as in, yeah. But this character's got an eye patch. We're inclusive, um, and it means nothing. Or it's like a yeah. oh, this person is in a in a wheelchair, but they're but they're a genius, so it's the redeeming feature. Or you go Professor down, X. Yeah. Or you go down. I can name a character every time. The um, like Life is Strange route of you're disabled. It's the worst thing in the world. Kind of oh my gosh. I like that, I hate that and they're the only three perspectives that we kind of get in games like again to list off a few examples because i'm kind of working on a bit of a yeah. project around this at the moment but metal gear solid for example you know uh, huey is a character from some of the games who is disabled but oh but he's a genius because he develops this amazing technology oh yeah um, despite course. the fact that majority of the fan base don't actually like him Fair. um in metal gear solid 3 you have Solid Snake, who, midway through the game, acquires an eye patch. Now, okay. one of the things I actually like, and I think it's a good representation, is that you only get it for like the last third of the game, 
And the character mm. doesn't make much of it, but it actually affects yeah. your first person perspective. Okay. So for the whole game that you have this and then it's changed and it actually affects the player. And I thought okay. that's really good representation. And then it, it it's, is it's not it's not then mentioned in any of the games with the eye patch. It's just ignored. Cause then the eye patch is just cool. Or well, he's got a robot eye now, so it's fine. So like you know, yeah, you, of course, of you course. get this whole thing like and again like a uh, quick fix. Final Fantasy, yeah. like RPGs is the perfect game to have disabled characters because it doesn't matter if they're yes. in a wheelchair or give give them a battle wheelchair. D and D do it. Um, J- Jennifer Critchner, I think her name is. I apologize if that's wrong, but she like specializes in writing like disabled and accessibility content for things like D and D, like a battle wheelchair and stuff. Give me give me an so, RPG oh. where someone can have like a battle wheelchair as their weapon. Why can't it happen? We live in a world of fancy and dragons and magic and crap, right? Um, yeah. But no, we yeah. get we get a character who like might have a cool eye scar, like Final mm. Fantasy. You know, it's Final Fantasy Seven, one of my favorite games. Red Thirteen has one eye. Doesn't doesn't affect him. Not never mentioned. It just looks cool, I guess. Um, Barrett has a gun arm, but it's like, yeah, isn't it cool? He's got a gun arm that fire stuff. So like it's it's like it's touched on, but it's like but like Barrett's also like you know. Um, but he's oh, but he's a badass, so it's fine. Like it's just you know what I mean. Like it's really tough where you could have yeah, this fantasy yeah. where you but... could have like a meaningful storyline and actually explore it and make that meaningful and actually talk about people's representation, or it just tends to be really tokenistic. I wanna I wanna go back to Marvel, um, jokes aside, all mm-hmm. jokes aside, um, because when you talk about all that kind of disability, of course, you can think of the latest Marvel Avengers and what comes next. And you will have Bucky, for example, with his arm in um, whatever the medal from Wakanda is, mm-hmm. um, which is amazing. But they talk about it and, you know, they he talks about the fact that he doesn't have an arm. Uh, and, and that is cool. I think that he mentions it and that he he says that he lives with it. You know, he's fine. But in Marvel, uh, there was also the X-Men <laughs> at some point. Oh. Um, and I think the X-Men, I don't know if you've ever had the chance to read some comic books, but they go a bit further than the movies where it's really mellow uh, when they talk about, what was her name? The one that when she kisses her boyfriend, she kills him because she aspires, she, she takes uh, his vitality. Anyway, um, basically her thing is that when she touches people, she can take their life. Oh, she has, yeah, she, yeah. I know what you mean. You know. Um, and they talk a lot about how she feels about it. And this is not um, a realistic disability, but it is a disability in a way. And I like that X-Men before a lot of other pop culture scenarios ended up doing that. On the other hand... Professor Xavier <laughs> is in a wheelchair, but you know but he's gene, still he can Professor move stuff X. With his mind, so it's fine. exactly. Tokenism is hard, but it's worse when they cherry pick stereotypes to inform. Yes, and, I, and I'm not saying yes. I'm the authority. By the way, I'm not saying that like there is any easy solution because I think just again going yeah. back to like the RPG example. Okay, you just have yeah. one main character who, uh, yo, is in a battle wheelchair, right? But then, like, that's it. It's tokenism if, like, oh, well, we gave you your inclusive character. Make other yeah. people in the world disabled with different yeah, disabilities. Just, you don't have to make it a story as well, you know? It can just be there. You can just have you an NPC also... in the shop in a wheelchair, yeah. and that'd be fine. It's fine. Like <laughs> A message to all the game creators out there. Don't have to make a story. Just has to exist. Yeah, like just let <laughs> it let it exist. We have so many games that are huge and expansive and huge worlds, right? Like you can just in- include a bit of inclusivity because, like, that's it. Like, so you either have the we gave you your inclusive character and their inclusive side quest. Like you see a little bit of it with like I think like um you know that type of thing of like well, oh well this is a big deal, you know uh, Charlie on the hydrate. It's a good shout. Um, and they make a big deal out of it and go, okay, you're done. Thanks. Please leave. Get on with it. Yeah. Or, um, oh, well, like, it was it was there. We just didn't make a deal out of it. Like, you kind of need both. Like, there needs to be, like, I don't want to use the term because it's kind of political, but, like, proportional representation. Like, yo, know, you have it. It's significant for some people. It's not for others. It's part of the story, and then it's not. And I'm not saying I have the instant answer or that it's really easy to 
do that but like on a very base level if you just include the world and all the different people that inhabit that world that's a start it is and to circle back to detroit there is i think a good try i am not saying that they made it i'm saying that there is a try and i'm already happy and that's a bit sad to say but i'm yeah, already sad happy that the bar to see. is that low yeah <laughs> but it gives me hope i have hope when i see that kind of things i say okay they they didn't not think about it you mm-hmm. know there must have been someone in that team that was like by the way <laughs> Would that change a lot of things if we added that and that and that in the environment? And this, this again, and it breaks, and it, it's also a, another good point. I know we mentioned it on the podcast, but about like finding the gay button um, was yeah. one of the things. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> in the Witcher. <laughs> but like, you have to do like three side quests to get the one guy that is gay in the entire universe. It's crazy. But, but like, the other, the other side of that is then don't, if, if you're an aspiring game dev listening to this for reasons, um, don't then just turn around and it's like the one person from a community in your building though because that's exhausting when you're always having to like try and represent yourself to represent that you are an equal party in whatever venture you're in but then also having to do all the additional work to represent other people like actually get in touch with the consultants approaching a community on yeah there, do a focus group like and it's not like you being UK, UK based, there is quite a few communities that can help you with 